Good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Todd, as Genevieve told you. I'm uh, a captain and commander of our Criminal Investigations Division here at the Police Department. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us here this morning as we talk about some uh, significant developments in this case, this 1985 homicide of De uh, Miss De Denise Stafford. Um, in a minute, I'm going to have the distinct honor of introducing the investigators that worked on this case most recently. Uh, but before I do that, I want to thank uh, our crime scene technicians, uh, victim advocate Jude Castro, and most importantly, the Stafford family who's here to, uh, to share this moment with us. So, uh, Over the past year, our detectives have been actively poring over the original investigative reports, evidence, and witness statements in an effort to solve this case. I'm happy to tell you that this hard work and dedication has paid off as we have identified the individual who perpetrated this horrendous crime. In a second, I'm going to introduce you to the investigators, but before I do, um, I would be remiss if I did not give public acknowledgement to the retired detectives, officers, and crime scene technicians who worked tirelessly on this case from the time the 911 call came in in 1985, and in some cases until these folks retired 20 years later. Uh, while this list is too long to, to mention now in an effort to, to, to keep the uh, press conference uh, timely, I did have the honor of personally calling each and every one a couple of weeks ago to let them know that due to their hard work and investigative foundation that they built, we were able to come to a successful outcome in this case, and they were beyond uh, excited and happy to hear that news. So if they're watching and listening this morning, again, a sincere thank you for the hard work that you put in uh, over the years on this case. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to the lead investigator for this case, Investigator Jeff Birdwell, uh, as well as Detective Anthony DeFrancisco, who also contributed significantly in this case. Gentlemen, if you will, please step forward. Investigator Birdwell will give you a detailed summation of the crime itself, and he will uh, describe the recent break breakthroughs in evidence and analysis that we utilized that allowed us to finally bring justice to Denise Stafford and to her family. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for coming out here and having the uh, interest and support of the family members. That's truly why we're all here. Um, I'd like to share something with you from Ralph Waldo Emerson, where he spoke about the purpose of life. He basically said that the purpose of life is to be useful, honorable, compassionate, and to make a difference that you lived. Um, I am blessed to be in a position with this organization to where that's possible, to where uh, I have an opportunity due to the chief and to the commanding officer to look at old cases and hopefully um, through compassionate and effort make a difference. And that's what we're celebrating uh, this morning is that opportunity. Um, there's an author called Michael Connolly. Uh, he writes a series of fictional books about a character named Harry Bosch. And in every one of his books, he talks about two things. The answer is in the murder books. And he keeps going over them and keeps going over them. And the motto he lives by is, everyone matters or no one matters. And truly, that's the motto for us, is that regardless of how old these cases are, or regardless if the person who did it is alive, incarcerated, or dead, the answers are in the books, and if we put forth the effort and apply today's science, we've got a chance to make a difference. Um, this case is from 1985, October. Denise was uh, a new mom at home alone with Nicole, and her husband Frank was at work. Uh, he worked at a local lounge called the playground. The original detectives in the crime scene um, technicians provided us the foundation to, to bring us to today because the answers were in that crime scene and the answers were in the hard work of those detectives who poured hundreds and hundreds of hours uh, interviewing people and documenting it. These volumes represent their effort. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages that demonstrate their effort to bring this to its proper conclusion. In that crime scene, uh, and I'll do this as 
in a way not to be as graphic as, as I can, there is evidence that Denise was attacked while standing up. That evidence told us that somehow from the initial attack that she ended up in her final resting place, which was on a bed and on her back. She was also spun around on the bed. In other words, her head was at the foot of the bed, which would, is totally uncommon for any of us. So she had to be placed there. Well, in 1985 through 1995, we didn't have DNA to rely on in the court system. And even as late as the 2007, 2008 and onward, a, a process called touch DNA had not been recognized by the court systems and wasn't a process that was conducted by state labs. It is very well recognized now, today. And so looking at the crime scene, we decided to send garments off to where an individual would have had to touch her to place her on the bed. And on those garments, underneath her knees and around her ankles, from her pants, we got a DNA hit. And that came back to Joseph Magaletti. Joseph Magaletti was already serving life in prison for a homicide that he committed uh, the Sheriff's Department worked. The homicide was in 1995, and he was arrested in 1999. So he was already serving time for that homicide. Thinking again that the original detectives had no idea how important, or I'm sure they knew, but they didn't realize that 35 years later, what they wrote and what they documented through crime scene photographs and documentation would bring us to this conclusion so many years later. But it was truly their work. In their writings, they were able, even though they didn't say that Magaletti was a suspect, he was a person of interest for them, along with a few other people. But they took the time to do hundreds of interviews and they drew a nexus for me today of placing Magaletti at that house. And what I mean by that is, the husband, Frank Stafford, worked with Magaletti at the playpen. So he was aware of what Frank did for a living and he was aware of his hours because he worked at a lounge, he worked late at night. There was also some um, out of employment association actually at the home itself. So now we put Magaletti knowing the husband and knowing the house and knowing the occupants of the house. There's also documentation there where Denise actually got a pair of seat covers from Magaletti for her car. So now we can put the nexus even further that Denise and Magaletti knew each other. So truly, it's, it's, it helps us through those old documents to be able to bring that whole thing around to where he's no longer a person of interest. He's a real suspect. He's somebody that knew him, knew the occupants and could possibly pull this off. So when we send garments off, initially it comes back to us as a foreign DNA. It doesn't say Joseph Magaletti. Uh, that's still down the road. But it lets us know that there's a stranger who was in touch with her garments. But as the investigation continues and you start taking these little pieces of puzzles and putting them together, our crime scene girls today can now let the labs know, hey, we have somebody. We have somebody that thinks that could possibly have done this. And that's how this case comes together. More importantly, it shows you how many hands are involved in this. This isn't about me and it's not about um, Anthony DeFrancisco. We're just part of a big group of people over 35 years who have had the opportunity to do something. And that is that we work for the family. In that same author, in his books, he writes, we speak for the dead. Well, Denise spoke for herself when you look at the crime scene. She told us, and just like he writes in his books, the answers in the homicide books. That's where those answers were. So um, I'm happy to try to answer questions if somebody has some, but um, truly it is a blessing to be here to be able to provide some type of closure, some type of answers for y'all. 
Um, I know it's a little nerve wracking to come in here. It is for us too, but we appreciate y'all being here. And I think if you get a chance to look behind you, there's a ton of law enforcement officers, a ton of civilian people. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize Sharon Ross. She's our office manager. She has a phenomenal passion for cold cases. And uh, she has been instrumental in research. And our crime scene girls, they get tired of me because I'm always asking them for stuff. But at the end of the day, all those people behind you and everybody you see walking down these hallways, they're all working for you. And they're working for other families. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up if, after this short point. There's three reasons why this is important. First and foremost, it's important for this family. It's important for them to know that this agency cares for them deeply and that we haven't forgotten about y'all and we certainly hadn't forgot about Denise and we hadn't forgotten about Nicole, her daughter. Secondly, it's important for the families who doesn't have an answer yet, who's where their loved one was taken and they're concerned every single day about what happened, who did it, and are any, is anybody looking at my case? The answer is yes. There is somebody looking at your case, and the reason for it are these gentlemen here, because they have put resources in place so these cold cases can get some fresh eyes on them. And with fresh eyes and new technology, we've got a chance. And lastly, third, it's important for every suspect out there who hasn't been arrested to understand you haven't gotten away with it. We're still coming. You still need to look over your shoulder and with some effort on our part and with technology, your day's coming. That's all. Questions? I'm sorry? No, Mr. Magaletti died in prison, serving life. So my question would be, there's definitely a relation, a known acquaintance between Mrs. Stafford and Mr. Magaletti. What evidence do you have that he murdered her? Is there further forensics or something about that? Well, if, if, yeah, if you take a look at the actual crime scene, and remember she's laying on her back, and the DNA is taken from the back of her pants in the back of her ankles and knees. So whoever placed her on the bed, her final resting place, that person is Joseph Magaletti. We know that you've worked cold cases in the past. We know that you had um, some success in finding others. Just what, how did it feel that moment when you were able to really connect him and give the family a call and say, we figured it out? Um, it's phenomenal. It, it really is. Um, anybody that does this kind of work, um, you know, you always want to be the guy they ask to go in the box to do the interview. You always want to be the guy that hits the home run on a case. Um, so when it happens, it's, it's very fulfilling. Um, you know, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, I did it for 30 years at the Lakeland Police Department, and I've been here for five. Uh, so this opportunity is the reason I keep doing it. Uh, I wish success was every single time. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. So when, when success happens and you get to share it with a lot of people that participated in it, it's extremely rewarding. Can you just give Cole Cases a Oh, absolutely. I, I pray it does. I, I, you know, I, that's why we're here. Um, I, I hope that everybody understands that yesterday's homicide is just as important as tomorrow's. Um, just because it's been a year, five years, 10 years, 35 years, it's no less important to me. It's no less important to Detective DeFrancisco. Um, we still strive every single day to find that one nexus that we didn't have, that one sliver of evidence that we can get some answer to. Uh, so I pray that uh, these moments are, are reassuring.
Well, it comes back to us as a foreign DNA, in other words, an unknown. And so before it can be utilized or, or, or be determined to be a match, a person has to be identified. And depending on the circumstances, because the criteria changes a little bit dealing with old cold cases um, and degrading evidence and people that are no longer available versus a new person or a new case or a suspect that is available rather. So it may require us to get a suspect's DNA. Just because they're in a database doesn't mean that we have access to that database if they're a named suspect. So it may require us to get a new DNA sample so it can be compared to what they have discovered uh, in the laboratory. Um, it's not as easy as TV, I sure wish it was. Um, if if uh, that was possible, who knows, maybe someday. You know, we spoke in private earlier that the technology today, whether it's the genealogy that's so popular right now or our genetic, um, DNA genetic trees or family familiar DNA, um, in five years or 10 years, that'll be antiquated. You know, these scientists today, they will create something that we can't even imagine. And so I, I believe truly that with a little effort on our part um, and the advancements in science, that we've got a real true shot at some old cases. Help us understand the why of the statistics. I'm, I didn't hear it, I'm sorry. Help us understand the why of the statistics. Why, was there any motive that was uh, you know, put forward at any point? Did you have an opportunity to interview Magaletti when he was uh, identified as a person of interest? Um, anything that you can piece together? Um, some of that is, some of this is not public record yet, so I have to, to dance around a little bit. But um, Magaletti, from this time through 95, uh, in his criminal records show that he um, was a drug abuser and he would commit crimes to support his addiction. Um, whether it was in the file, it talks about him uh, stealing from department stores and fencing new products, whether it was a vacuum cleaner or, or a VCR or whatever it might have been to support his habit. He didn't keep jobs very regularly, again, because of his drug problems. And we know he, we know he killed Denise. We know he killed one person in 1995 in the county. We suspect him of another one that I'm looking at. Um, that's not to say he did it, but we suspect him of it. And the county suspects him, uh, or even it's documented that the county looked at him at that time for a second homicide. So you're dealing with, by definition, a serial killer. So I don't know that that, that kind of mentality has a motive other than feeding their own wicked interest. And truly, he was uh, led around by his addiction mm -hmm. on drugs to commit crimes. Um, and we've demonstrated today the nexus to the family, to the address. So it's speculation. I cannot tell you this is why, but maybe the motive was robbery. Maybe he knew the family had something, uh, uh, an item that he could utilize. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know the motive that brought him to their house uh, on October of 1985. I just know the results. But you suspect he was a serial killer. What number was finished on the police that you suspect? I, I don't know that yet. I mean, I don't. I know she was early for us. Um, but I don't know if at the end of all this we'll get with the FBI, I'm sure, with VICAP and other people. You know, he, he isn't a native of Sarasota. He came here from up north. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done on Joseph Magaletti, but today's focus is truly about Denise Stafford and her family. I'm sorry? Your name again? It's Jeff Birdwell. It's spelled like it sounds, a bird and a whale, B-I-R-D-W-E-L-L. -L. Excuse me. This is Chief. Hi, I'm Chief Jim Reeser with the Sarasota Police Department. 
Um, I wanted to make sure that it, what was highlighted here was the efforts by uh, everyone. Uh, it, this is the case that proves tenacity by this agency. It starts with the officer that, that responds to the scene, right? Uh, I tell all the officers, uh, all the brand new officers, it starts with you. Uh, then it goes to the supervisor. Then it goes to our criminalistics techs. Um, they do an amazing job. It goes to the detective, um, and then they carry it through. Um, the records techs, um, everybody's a team here, and uh, this is proof positive. Thank you all. Thank you for everything you do. Um, thank you, family. Um, we talked down there, and I said there's nothing but support here. So we appreciate everything, everything. So um, Genevieve, do you have anything else? don't have to no go ahead and identify oh. yourself uh, I'm Dorla Nipper I'm Denise's mother and I just wanted to say thank you so much to the Sarasota Police Department for 35 years investigating and com coming to the conclusion finding that Mr. Magaletti was the perpetrator and that he's gone he's not going to harm anyone else. That has been my hue and cry from the beginning. I didn't want to see any other mother go through what our family has. And the police department has done a fabulous job. And I just want to thank not only these gentlemen here, but all the detectives from the beginning who worked on this case. Thank you so much. We need this police department and everyone across the country need our support. Uh, and I strongly uh, say that everyone should be thankful for the people that work in law enforcement. Thank you. Can you tell us what kind of person Denise was? She was, she was little. She was loving, uh, she was a good daughter, and we just all love her and miss her. Thank you. That concludes today's news conference. I can get with members of the media if you guys have questions or need spellings afterwards. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us and stay safe.